Thank you all for coming, and welcome to the first lecture of this semester's guest lecture series. Uh, if you're a new first-year student, uh, I'm Joe Colello, I'm the dean of the college. Welcome to the college if you're just joining us. Uh, in a moment, John Montlock, who is hosting Brandon Pitcher's visit, will uh, introduce Brandon, but I want to tell you a little bit about the series this week. We're going to have probably uh, just about a lecture a week, typically Mondays at 4 o'clock is when we do them. We're going to have a couple of sessions. Uh, this month, following Brandon's lecture next week, uh, a faculty member of ours, Steve Kendall, who has been on, um, on a special leave last year, is going to talk about something he's been working in. He's the director of our Building Futures Institute. He's been working in a domain called Open Building. He's going to talk about that work in a lecture which he's also recently given at the Technical University of Berlin and at the University of Moscow. So I'm looking forward to Steve's work and what he's been able to do over the past uh, uh, semester. In fact, this is an aggregation of a lot of work that he's done, but it's a particular talk that he's given. Steve, are you here in the room? Yeah, Steve's here. Stand up. Stand up so everybody can see who Steve, Steve Kendall is. If you haven't had Steve before. Uh, Steve will do that. Uh, Steve's talk will be followed by a visit from uh, um, uh, an unusual visitor for us. Uh, will Miller is the son of someone named J. Irwin Miller. J. Irwin Miller founded a program in Columbus, Indiana years ago. Uh, through a foundation there that decided that it would invest in architects' fees from premier architects and uh, other designers and planners in uh, Columbus, Indiana. And uh, Will has a kind of group at the, uh, the feet of his father among uh, uh, leading practitioners in our disciplines and uh, has become something of a scholar on the work of Ariel and Eero Saarinen. And we'll be here to talk about their work in a lecture that he will also do at Yale later this year. I think he may have been here once before, certainly J. Irwin Miller was here during his lifetime, but if you are uh, conversant with what's going on in that city over the last 45 years, it's been a pretty remarkable legacy. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a couple visitors who are former CAP faculty members, uh, Art Shaler, who formerly taught the architecture department and now runs the program at Norwich University, will visit us and Art has a particular passion for the intersection of art and architecture. He'll be followed by uh, Daniel Doe, also a former faculty member, now Dean of Ryerson Institute of Art in Toronto, Canada, will speak. Um, Daniel will be followed by a couple of lectures which we will co-sponsor with series. Um, is it uh, Mark Lefebvre will be here from Toronto, and John Todd, who made The Living Machine. He's the head of the patent on The Living Machine, one of which is up at Jim Davis's Institute for the Cause. Uh, we'll be here to talk about uh, what he sees as a critical intersection between uh, design, ecology, and uh, engineering with the disciplines of our college. I'll stop there because uh, there'll be posters up. You may have seen one type. We have another one that's about to go up that has a, looks more like a film strip here, and we'll be circulating these around. They'll also be available to you on the website if you want to see the entirety of the lecture series. But at this point, I'm going to stop and turn the podium over to John Motlock, who will introduce today's speaker. Incidentally, for those of you who don't know John, John is a professor here, and he is also the director of our Land Design Institute. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce today's speaker, Brandon Pitcher. I've known Brandon for about three years. We actually first met in the Chicago airport as the, uh, a group of us from the uh, Land Design Institute at Ball State were on our first trip to Brazil. Uh, Brandon is with an organization that's done extensive work in integrated technologies in, uh, in Brazil as well as other parts of the world. Uh, Brandon is one of about 100 people in the United States who are certified in a program called ZERI. Uh, the Zero Emissions Research Institute, or ZERI, is a global network of innovators who are focusing on the major problems in the world today. Uh, Ziri members share a common vision that sees waste as food and that seek to use the resources of the world in a more efficient manner, doing more with those resources, addressing all the needs of all species, not just humankind. Uh, Ziri works through an effort, a, a process of trial and error, putting together the best of scientists, entrepreneurs, and educators to build a more positive future for, for the world. Brandon's 
The work has included extensive research in Ziri technologies. This research has taken him around the world, visiting projects, Ziri projects, and also visiting some of the unique places in the world, one of which will be part of his presentation today, Las Gaviotas in, uh, in Colombia. Brandon has presented Ziri projects around the world, including presentations to the 10th Congress at the United Nations uh, University in, uh, in Tokyo, as well as the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm. Brandon is currently a student, like yourself, he's a student in a Master's of Systems Design program in Turin, Italy, Torino, Italy. This is a two-year program that brings pioneers in the sciences, in business, in industry, and in systems design uh, together to work closely with students over a two-year period. Brandon is also co-authoring a book on systems design in action around the world. He's also working on a new company to uh, import products produced in Las Gaviotas as well as in Zuri projects throughout uh, Colombia to the rest of the world. Uh, a brief reminder that following the presentation today, refreshments will be served in the gallery by the uh, student chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. So as I said before, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Brandon Fisher. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for taking the time to be here. I'm excited to present again. Um, we'll get started. As he said, I'm a master's student in systems design polytechnico right now, so I will show you some things that I've learned over the past years and from my uh, traveling around the world. So basically, i talk about zero emissions. We started in 1994 at the United Nations University in Tokyo, and we have been working ever since. Uh, we have projects in six, seven, five continents around the world um, right now, over 40 projects. But the Ziri concept is based on the efficiency and resilience of natural systems. We follow biomimicry. We've been doing that since the beginning. That's our inception. So we look at how to design systems. So what we do is we observe nature. You know, we observe how ecosystems work. So we take this. Ants do not have traffic jams. You know, so if you see that, you know, human beings are very good. I just got back from New York City last night. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing how long traffic is there. But we see here we have billions of ants walking through one hole and out there, never a traffic jam. Same thing with bees. We observe, how, again, whoop, we go back there, how ecosystems work. Seal colonies do not create excessive pollution. You know, when they get in large co conglomerations of numbers, they don't have problems. You don't see waste, you don't see landfills. We have that in the human species. You know, even desert plants generate drinking water. You know, this plant here lives in the desert. It can get its own water when there is none through condensation at nighttime. So it's amazing to see. Basically, this is the atmosphere. This is basically the Gaia theory. You know, the Earth's crust, which is where we live in the five kingdoms of nature, on a very thin layer. You know, and all the basic needs of humanity in all five kingdoms of nature are created and sustained within the Earth's crust and the atmosphere and the balance in between it. And as we uh, interrupt the, 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 you know, the, the atmosphere with our changing through uh, climate change and, and global warming, that changes how we're going to meet our basic needs in the future. Uh, in nature, we see that nature has the ability to integrate and separate everything with engineering and biology to meet all the basic needs. Human beings are very good at integrating everything, but we have no idea how to take it apart after we build it. So we are looking at a lot of separation technologies now to uh, deal with everything from computers, TVs, cars, CDs, um, clothes. We work with the five kingdoms of nature and their five design principles. Those numbers don't really mean a whole lot. They can change. Uh, they're talking about adding more kingdoms of nature to it, or some people are saying less. There's a theory out now that think fungus and animals should be in the same kingdom, so I let the scientists argue that matter, not me. And the five design principles will change over time. We're an evolving organization. We're just at five today. We may go down to three. We don't know. But the five kingdoms of nature are these, the bacteria, the algae, the protoctista, the scientific name, plants, animals, and fungi. So we use these five kingdoms to design all of our projects. So in the, in the five kingdoms of nature, each species is at its best thanks to relations with other species from other kingdoms. Uh, interconnectedness in the web of life from Fritjof Capra, you've probably heard of all this, is very important and it's very important in our work to study this. There are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people on this planet. So think about that. You know, I tell people this all the time. 
You know, you shouldn't use antibiotics so much. You shouldn't use antibacterial soap because it's a slow suicide. You know, you're basically destroying yourself. Total, uh, how do I go back? <coughs> total biomass weight of ants and krill. Each equals the total body weight of humans. Just ants and krill, these small organisms, you know. The, the most prevalent organism on the planet are probably worms. You know, that's what we're finding now. We're finding very small worms about the size of bacteria. Nope, go wrong way. So the five pieces of nature where so much beauty is created beyond plants and animals. Right now, the definition of sustainability basically just focuses on plants and animals. It leaves the other three kingdoms out of sustainability. So we must include them because they are the inherent, they, they create the inherent ability for nature to sustain life. Uh, so where we all are in a permanent and tireless co-evolution. That is where we are trying to head in zero emissions is to get human society back into co-evolution with nature instead of dominance more of a stewardship role and understanding evolution. In nature, where problems turn into opportunities, we don't see problems as uh, stumbling blocks. We see them as opportunities. There's an old Chinese diagram, you know, or a sign for danger, which is opportunity or danger, you know, crisis. You know, it depends on how you look at it. We see opportunities. Zero methodology is based on nature's five design principles, and I will go through those in a moment. The first one, no species eats its own waste. Whatever is a waste for one is food for another belonging to another kingdom. If a species eats its own waste, it will degenerate. This is where mad cow disease comes from, feeding the waste of sheep, ground up sheep to cows. We're finding this now within uh, shrimp and, and salmon farming. You know, shrimp farming because they got the white spot virus and they're feeding the, the shrimp uh, slaughterhouse waste. You know, and shrimp are algae eaters, not meat eaters. And they're feeding slaughterhouse waste. So be careful with what you eat. It's very dangerous. Second design principle of nature is whatever is a toxin for a species is neutral or nutrient for at least one species belonging to another kingdom. If you try to eliminate that toxin with the same kingdom, it will degenerate. We take the case of the apple. The apple uses arsenic around its seed to protect itself from other predators. And if you have a, a nice arsenic you know, a leached field, you could actually plant it with apple trees and it will remediate the area. You know, through select, uh, collecting the arsenic to around its seeds. But if you take that arsenic away, that species will degenerate. Third design principle, whenever there's a virus jeopardizing a species, it is harmless for species in at least three other kingdoms. So if you try to kill a virus from the same kingdom, it will degenerate. So basically what this is stating is that you know, uh, a virus may be bad for humans and a plant, but it won't be bad for fungus and bacteria and protoctista. It may be bad for bacteria and the plant, but not bad for humans. We must be very careful. Not all viruses are negative. We just don't know that much about them yet. Fourth design principle, the more diverse, the more local, the more efficient, the more resilient. This makes a whole lot of sense. So when we look at projects, we try to use the local knowledge, the most diversity of people we can find, the most creative talent. You know, then, you, then your projects will become more efficient and more resilient to change. Um, well, I went back to that. So if non-native species are introduced, the system will degenerate. We see that around all the time in the Great Lakes. We see that here in Indiana with all the species that are coming. So we must be very careful with what we do. Um, whenever species of the five kingdoms interact, the system will integrate and separate matter, ambient temperature, and ambient pressure. Well, we see this in, in, in biomimicry when you read Janine Benders' work. You've become very familiar with that. Um, if species less than the five kingdoms interact, the system degenerates accord <coughs> according to the second law of thermodynamics. So just the chaos, about the chaos theory. So apply these same principles, even if you aren't in an organic environment. This is to industry today. We work with many industries around the world. And um, the last one we worked with was Euroball, the world's largest ball bearing manufacturer. And we are introducing these principles into their uh, processes um, when we go back to Italy. So the case of the spider in this is the spider can eat, uh, you know, can eat uh, some, uh, insect that's been sucking blood of a human. The spider can eat an insect that's been eating bananas and it will always produce the same quality of silk. And it's stronger than our strongest material, Kevlar, you know, and it's made at ambient temperature. And the reason, and, and we didn't know why for a while, scientists do now know that it's because there's a symbiotic relationship of an algae and a fungus inside of a spider's stomach that helps it digest. So no matter what it eats, it can break things down and produce this silk, you know. <coughs> but what do scientists do today to get the same quality of silk? They, gen they find the enzyme that the spider uses and they genetically modify sheep. And they take that protein to make the enzyme and now they're making sutures for humans. So if you get a, a cut and you go to a doctor, you most likely have a GMO protein from a, a sheep now in your sutures. It's biodegradable, but it's not really sustainable. And it might just be dangerous. 
Um, this is a project I'll show about CD separation. We're looking at separation technology. So CDs, DVDs, the blue disc, laser discs, all these things. Uh, we, uh, a scientist from Columbia, Dr. Gloria Nino, has developed a, a technology with a, what we call, we're calling it a soup because you can actually eat this. I was eating this for breakfast the day we did this, but this test in Japan. It's a mixture of a Japanese radish, a daikon, a uh, rice husk enzyme, and an algae from Okinawa. And it's quite delicious too. And so you see here the glass of the CD shredded up. It's actually better not to shred the CD. I'll show you that in a later picture, but this was the test we ran first. And then after five to 10 minutes, this is what you get. You get pure polycarbonates back. It, the, the, the microorganisms go in and break the little molecules and separate the binding. And then the heavy metals stay in the soup and you can centrifuge that to get to the heavy metal, the gold, the silver, the lead, you know, the things that are very toxic for humans in the environment where you just throw our CDs or DVDs away. And then we can reuse the polycarbonates, which we now have an agreement with uh, the country of Italy, ANAS, the world's largest recycler, and um, Hitachi and Tejin, who's, who's going to do the recycling to make porous pavement around Italy to end um, hydroplaning in cars. And, and actually the insurance company is paying for it. So they can prevent, because they have 200 and some deaths a year from hydroplaning. And it saves them that makes a lot of sense. But here you see the CDs. The whole CDs are better to use than the shards than breaking it up, plus that reduces energy costs and labor. And then we can get to the original polycarbonates. We don't reuse the polycarbonates in the same system to make CDs. We think it will degenerate. It's not one of nature's design principles. This just shows the Colombian soup. But we have an actual different version in Colombia that uses a fungus in Japan, and then acidic acid, which is what they currently use today at Tejin. And it's the acidic acid you can see hardly does anything compared to the others. So if we only teach what we know to our children, they can only do as bad as we are doing. So we need to think about re how we train people and educate them. So do we only expect children to repeat in exams all that we know? Um, this is not good. We shouldn't teach people just from a book and tell them that to, to repeat this. They need to be able to be creative and think on their own. We have 36 fairy tales for people now that we use for children around the world. We talked about the city of Curitiba earlier with uh, some of the Brazilians. And they have 120,000 students have now taken the curriculum. They beat out uh, Media Lab uh, from MIT and um, Center for Eco Literacy out of Berkeley. But so this is a th uh, saying, you know, if you give a man a fish, he will not be hungry for the day. If you teach him how to fish, he will overfish. So we are changing this a little bit. You know, we, we don't always have constraints sometimes. Uh, again, so this is a nice book you could get online. It's called Out of the Box, written by my mentor, Gunter Pauli. We have to be more creative and innovative and implement systems. This has 21 of the fairy tales used to train management uh, executives because CEOs of companies and marketers don't understand ecology and they're not going to take the time to go back to school and take the years to learn in, 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 in intricate detail. So we must make it easy and, ex uh, and accessible to everyone. So very short stories, I need three minutes, I can tell a story and I can help, I can explain how an ecosystem works. So even as we are all dedicated to Gaia, we do not think nor act in systems. This is why sustainability is not happening. We're just substituting processes for processes and molecules for molecules, not systems. So we need to imagine, design and implement systems. There we are. So humanity cannot expect the earth to produce more. We must do more with what the earth already produces. So I'll show you a case of deep pond fish farming based off of pig waste in Fiji. Something that could be very valuable to everywhere that has pigs, especially here in Indiana. This just shows the farm to the boys' school in, in Fiji. Here's uh, the, the area. They had some problems. They needed to get funding. They were running out of money to keep the school open. And so we went there in 1994 to design. I, I didn't design it. I was, I'm just part of the team here now. So here you see the integrated farming. You see the, the systems, which you have. You have down here a house, pigs, housing for pigs. These pigs are very happy, very clean, very natural. They, they sleep on beds and they go to the bathroom. They potty train. They know where to go to the bathroom over here and they sleep over here. You know, they're not dirty. Pigs do not like to wallow in the mud. They just do that when they're hot because they have no way to be cool. They need shade. They're not dirty animals. They're quite intelligent. Um, so what you see now is the pig waste goes into a bio digesters from the here into the one they're in the ground and that produces methane energy. They can gather methane energy to support energy for the buildings and the electricity that they need in cooking. And then it goes into shallow ponds for algae, which I'm going, I'm going to here. There you can kind of see the, the tube. The only thing, only maintenance once this system is up ever takes is one time a day this man has to go in and stick that tube in the pipe so it doesn't get clogged. 
It's a never failing system that needs no maintenance. It just runs on its own once it's built. Here you see them going through the shallow ponds. This is where they produce algae. You can grow spirulina. You can grow many different types of algae, chlorella, blue green. Here are the, the guys working in this region. They said they would never be able to grow food because it was too much clay. They wouldn't be able to do all the, and the scientists said it's not possible to do anything. And then they proved to them that it is something we like to do in Ziri. So here you see the algae being harvested. Here now they have fish. Now they can sell this fish to the market and they make $60,000 a year or something on the fish. They can do so much more. What we found out now though is after this was built, um, nature always takes over. Now there are crabs coming back so they no longer need to sell the fish. They can eat all the fish. They sell the crabs at a premium and make a lot more money they do with the fish. And they came in off the local streams. So uh, it's autopoetic system. Nature will take over once you give the right uh, environment for it which I'll go over in the Gaviotas case, that's the fish. This is the man, George Chan. I know John's familiar with his work. He's designed biodigesters all around the world in over 80 countries. He's 83 years old and he is still working at it. He is an amazing man and a, and a very good friend. Design principles for eco-development, beauty and joy. So integrated building systems using bamboo. And uh, we'll talk about your home. <coughs> so how can we have cool air without air con? How can we build you know, passive design? This is a termite mound. This is a hotel or apartment building in Zimbabwe. It has no air conditioning system in it. It's very hot and will never get above 80 degrees. Here's a man standing by a termite mound in Africa. In Africa, the termite mounds are huge. And in Colombia, they're very small. So a little bit different. Um, this is a school in the north of Sweden. You can see the, the, this termite mound system built in here. This is the air intake. It keeps it warm in the winter and hot in the summer. You have to go six feet down, so three meters, um, and it comes around and comes back inside. And you no longer need an air conditioning system or a heating system in the school. And we have some solar technologies also here, but you must have the chimneys. See all those chimneys, that produces the airflow. You have to have that airflow. So you have a constant flow of fre fresh air. Here just shows some of this, because most of you are architects, I believe, so I had to show some architecture pictures. So. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but if you want to know more, I can. I can just kind of get you an idea that we do have the, the detailed knowledge. Here is Green Zone. This is one of my favorite commercial architecture projects in Sweden. Again, the same architect who did the school did this. This is a Ford factory, a McDonald's, and an oil station on one that's almost on a zero, <coughs> zero waste system. And uh, I will go through some pictures here. This is what you see while you're driving. You see the waste uh, water here. It comes down here, storm water, and some of the oil gets dealt with in here. Um, nice gardens. And then that's the Ford factory. That is the roof of the Ford factory. It is red in the fall and yellow in the spring. It is a beautiful, beautiful roof. And um, we could do this here in the United States very easily. It, it lives all year long in Sweden. And this is northern Sweden, it's very cold. These are the air filters. These are called Levande filters. You can see them on the internet. That's L-E-V-A-N-D-E dot S-E. And uh, that's, I think that you can have a site in English. These are very nice. You can see a better view of them here. This is actually in where they do the work on the cars, lots of the exhaust, lots of uh, issues, but it's very clean in there. It's very nice. And they work very well. This is the inside of the, show, the floor room. And what they found in this, uh, once they designed this, the Karstead was his name, he designed, he designed this, they found that um, they now have, they sell more cars than any other Ford company in this region. And they have less turnover, they have less employees being sick, and they're, they can sell their cars at a higher price. And they sell all these flex fuel cars there, which allow ethanol and, um, and different things. Here's just another view, just shows the beauty behind it. Um, it's hard to see. Here's another thing, we have renewable energy use, 100% renewable energy use, surface water collection is 100%, reduction in the use of fresh water from public supply is 70%, it has uh, dry toilets and water reuse, um, reuse of nutritive substance from toilets, 100%, compulsory environmental training, environmental certification, awareness, reuse and recycling of materials, 99%. Um, one of the problems we have is with McDonald's oil. We don't know what to do with it. So we're learning, trying to figure that out now. Reduction of external energy for cooling, 100%. We do it all inside, you know, and then 60% heat and 60% electricity con consumption reduction. Here shows what's going on, just kind of a diagram going into the energy, the waste energy from McDonald's and the oil change goes in and heats the forward factory. So that reduces its energy needs all on one site. So it has gone very well. Um, 
not going to go too much into that. This again is another uh, eco design. This is a five star hotel in northern Egypt on the Siwa Oasis. It, is, it has no air conditioning systems, and it's, you see by the location, passive design, beautiful place, um, very nice, stays cool all year round. Uh, placement by the mountains protects it from some of the wind also. So this is a project in Colombia. If you farm tropics in the tropics, then you have bamboo. Uh, there are many, many species of bamboos that you can use. Bamboo brings water back to the land. It's natural irrigation. It creates biodiversity, shelters for the species. It protects against chemicals from the neighbors if there's bad farms nearby. And it is a great construction material. So here, if you plant bamboo on 100 square meters, you can, after three years of growth, you can harvest a house once a year. You can build a house once a year on three, three 100 square meters. That's 300 square feet. You know. Uh, you know, this is the bamboo forest. I do tell people when they go to bamboo forest, you must be careful. The coral snake lives there. They're the most deadly snake in the world, and they hunt you down. <laughs> they don't, you know, they will come hunt humans. It's, this is a, a bamboo structure on the, in Manizales. This is actually on the Ziri farm that we're doing work on. Beautiful area. This is the, these are the houses that we have um, in Colombia that you can build. You can build this for less than $5,000. And in Colombia, that's very important because people can't afford to build houses. They don't have the income. Um, but you can see fully bamboo, natural air conditioning, uses the, the same principles as the school. Um, bamboo is smoked by its, its own waste products, so that way it will last 100 years. Um, the only problem that we know of is there's a termite that can eat steel that can also eat bamboo. Other than that, it has no problems. But it, that termite lives in Africa, not Colombia, so we're okay. But uh, you can see what I, I mentioned, uh, this, the, the social issues in bamboo were a little bit off in Colombia when they started doing this because it's, uh, it was known for, as a product for the poor people. And so what they did was they had to look around, so they put a balcony on. And once you put a balcony on, now it's for the middle class. And so now the people will buy into using bamboo again. So uh, just a psychological thing. There's a book out on this called Grow Your Own House. You can learn about this and learn about the technologies and it'll teach you how to put the bamboo together and how they've done this with very old techniques. This is the bamboo pavilion. It was at the World's Fair. And this one's actually in Colombia, designed by Simone Velasquez. This has over 4,500 bamboos joined together. The Germans had to come over and approve it to be built in the World's Fair. They did not believe bamboo was a building structure or building material with good structural support. And after they came and did testing, they found that it was better than steel. And now they, they believe it's, it passes all German building codes, and now they want to buy it. They can't get enough. Um, we say it, it, it will withstand an earthquake of 6.5. So we say that it dances with the rhythm of the earth. This is just the architect who designed it. He's actually not a registered architect, but he, he's a designer of this pavilion and, and the house. This one, one of the top 10 wonders of the world uh, from the Japanese Institute of Architects for Sustainable Architecture. Um, now we'll get into Las Gaviotas a little bit. This is what I'm working on now. We're generating the rainforest, combining drinking water, natural air, <coughs> air conditioning, tropical fruits, reducing slash fixing CO2, and kids having fun and health. This is Paulo Lugari. He's the founder and director of, of Las Gaviotas. He is an amazing man. He, uh, a very beautiful speaker if you understand Spanish. So it's good. This is the hospital they built in Las Gaviotas. It also won one of the top 10 Japanese uh, Institute of Architects for Sustainable Wonders. Um, what you see here on the top is hot water collectors um, and solar panels. And you kind of see a better picture here. The, the neat thing uh, about this hospital, which got shut down because the, the Bogota, the Colombian government, uh, made a law that you had to have so many people under your insurance policy, and that many people don't even live in this region. So they actually, the Colombian government shut them down. So now it's where the water's being bottled that we'll be selling. But um, what's neat about this hospital is where the patients are sick, the, the, the roof slides. Because the best antiseptic we have is the sun. So during the, the best time when the sun comes up, the roof will slide while the sun is over. And the, the sun will come down and, and, and be the a natural antiseptic, kill all of the viruses and bacteria so you don't spread disease throughout the patients, which is one of the big causes of disease in American hospitals hospitals all around the world. So, wait. so here you see the savannas. This is where we'll be doing the reforestation. Uh, we're working with the Colombian government now to reforest 16 and a half million acres of land. We're going to start with 120,000 acres. Uh, this is the Vichada. Right now there's no trees here. It's a pH of four. And going back to the sun being natural, the best antiseptic, it destroys all life. 
whenever on the midday. You know, there's hardly any rain here, and when it does rain, the hot plate effect happens, so the water just runs off so no life can survive. Um, it's very, very barren land. It's done through natural geoevolution. It's not caused by humans. But this is what they have done in Las Gaviotas. They have reforested it. Now there's 20,000 acres reforested. We're just going to continue that 20,000 acres into hopefully, where our goal is 16 million acres over time. But we'll start with the 120,000 acres we got uh, allocated today. But now from this pH of four, you plant these trees. It raises the pH, which I'll go through in a minute. But now over 250 species have come back. The rainforest can, will, can be regrown. It's the most successful case of the rainforest reforestation in the world. But our projects here, we want to create one of the world's largest freshwater reserves to create drinking water for all of South America and North America and elsewhere. If need be, um, we want to create one of the world's largest carbon sinks. We want to create biodiversity. We want to let the tropical forest go back to the rainforest and we'll create sustainable communities. We believe we can create around 100,000 local jobs in this region that have zero jobs today, except for cocaine growing. So first, to start this process on the pH of four land, you have to pick a tree. So we select the species. The species was a Caribbean pine. It was not native, because there were no trees that were native, but it's native within 300 miles of the region. So that's the species we use. The reason why it can survive and nothing else can is because of this little bitty magical mycorrhizal fungus. It's the most amazing thing on the planet, most likely, is this mycorrhizal fungus that you can, you know, you dip the roots in and then your plant can live and survive. 80% uh, of all vascular plants have a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, most people don't know that. But this shows them putting the mycorrhizal fungi on. On the ground, this is what it looks like in a spoon. So then we got to create a tree nursery, third, for drenching the trees in fungus. We also put the mycorrhizal fungus in the water, and then we spray it all on the trees. These are all machines that are developed at Las Gaviotas because they were not there before. And what's amazing about a lot of the technology in Las Gaviotas it was developed by people who can't read. They can't read nor write. They have no education. You know, Spanish is a second language. They're mostly indigenous tribes have been neglected over the years. So here you just see the tree farms in action. We can, the, the species of mycorrhizal fungi is Pisilithus, Pisilithus, Pisilithus tinctorius is the, the, the scientific name. So fourth, we must prepare the tree links for harsh life in the savanna. Savanna life is very difficult there for, for trees to survive. That's why they haven't been able to do it for so long. So we only, only the strong survive. So you see what happens, we go through. Right from there, they, they cut them up, they train them bad, they give them very little water, but they have one of the best survival rates I've ever heard of. 92% of the trees survive. I said, I planted 1,000 trees a few years ago on my land and only 10% survived. So I'm doing something wrong here in Indiana. So the fifth design is design planting systems. So we can design 1,000 hectares in three months. We can plant 1,000 hectares. There's about 2,500 acres in three months. Plant one tree every two seconds. And so we're going to do that 24 hours a day. And so we get 2,500 acres planted in three months, three month planting season in Columbia every year. Because it's uh, other times you don't have the, the ability to. Uh, but once we get ramped up and we get the financing, we can do a lot more. We can plant two trees per second. You know, we just have to get them, build the machines. But they are all designed. Here you can see the guy working. They just put the trees in and then somebody walks behind. It's, it's really amazing process to watch. Oops. So this is the, the, something that nobody really understood, that a monoculture can generate biodiversity. From planting one tree, you know, 250 species have come back. It's almost unheard of. You know, we, we, we complain about monocultures and farming right now, which is very bad, but we, this was a little, but it's, it's worked. It, it, it's raised the pH, and I'll explain that in a minute. So monoculture, here you go, you can see it. So, Basically, how the monoculture creates this biodiversity is it creates a shade cover, and that cools the temperature down, So, and then it, it brings clouds, and that will bring rain. And when the rain comes, then now the rain can stay in the ground, in the water, because it's not so hot. It doesn't get that hot plate effect, and the bacteria start coming, fungus start growing, and you start seeing a little bit of life come back. The pH raises to five and a half. You know, that's a, a factor of one and a half million. You know, and so that, that's working, it, it changes it quite high, and so other species can survive now, but really shade brought life in this environment, is what we say, not the sun at this point, shade brought the life. And so now we have a, a different uh, view of it. 
but this is, a, but then we plant 1,100 trees per hectare and we cut 500 down to allow biodiversity to come back, but I will explain that later in a later slide. The birds, the bees, and the wind create the link to the other forest, the rainforest, uh, the Amazon rainforest that is on the other side of the mountains, but not here, get to, you know, the birds come, they, they drop their seeds here, and the bees and the wind, so all the other species come back. It's not done by humans, it's done by nature. So six, the forest becomes an economic engine, thriving on diversity. We must have income for people to survive. It can't just have uh, pretty areas. Um, so you see here, this, uh, these are trees, California, palm. We have many different species walking through. This is collecting Colophonia. And Colophonia is a, it's an indigenous man, but here you cut this, never have to cut the tree down once we do this. We try not to cut any tree down, we don't have to, except for allowing the biodiversity to come back. But here you see the Colophonia is what's in paint. It makes paint shine. It's in gum to make it chewy, and it's in wax for girls to wax their legs and things like that, or guys if they want to too, I guess. And uh, but here you see the Colophonia coming out. They just bag it, and, and they, they, they go through, and then once they're done with the tree, they, they hardly, sometimes they may never see that tree again. A person may never ever see that tree again once they're done. Um, I don't see my, my factories out there's a white bleep, but that's actually a factory where that white is. So uh, seven, you got to create value added jobs. And, and so we are forest roots in California. You know, we'll have water, we'll have palm, we'll have rubber. This is showing the work of the California, the factory, where they're at here. Um, here's the inside of the factory. It's all produced by energy created locally. Right now they're using wood for nine hours a day, and for four hours a day they use a, a biodiesel that they create from palm oil. Here's just showing the California going through. Uh, they, they, got, they won a world prize for the environment from the United Nations for the design of the packaging of the California, because um, it can always be reused and sent back. Uh, so eight is the diverse forest generates drinking water. This is probably the most important um, drinking water <coughs> needed for everyone. It's much more needed in the future. So you can see the rainwater now creates reserves, lagoons, ponds. Very fresh. Here are children playing on a teeter-totter. I'm very hot in Colombia. It gets above 130 degrees in this region sometimes, Fahrenheit. So the kids, while they're playing, are pumping water for a swimming pool so they can get cooled off and play. So we like to have fun with this, and that must, must be enjoyable. And children involved all the time. The children are allowed to go anywhere they want to go. Here they're, buying, they're, they're putting water in polypropylene bags for the people. The bags are made of polypropylene because they're very strong. They can sit on the bags and they won't burst. If we use PET and we sit on it, it will burst. Um, polypropylene won't. But then once it's done, they can recycle it and make piping for, for their systems. This is, a, oh, this is a picture of the water from Las Gaviotas. It's a crystal, a water crystal, talking by Masaru Emoto. I'm not sure if any of you saw the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? But he's in that movie quite often. A lot of his work inspired that movie. Um, so, but he is one of the scientists in our network, uh, quite an amazing man. And um, he's taken a picture for us. We have a perfect hectagonal shape, so it means that it is pure water. It is clean water. There's no toxins in it. There's no thing. <coughs> These are the bottles that we will be using. These are called clicking bottles. And what they do is once we're done with the water, we hope children will learn to build building skills and engineering skills by putting them together. So it's, it's kind of like the concept of Legos. Um, but we are changing that design now in Italy to make the bottles click a little better and to make them uh, click with different sizes, from liters to half liters, you know, so that way you can build different structures. So I am now launching the sales of Gaviotas water in the United States, and I want to introduce this to people because we are trying to change the business model for sustainability, how to do this. So what we're looking at now is if you buy one bottle of water per day from Las Gaviotas for 25 years, you secure the financing of 20 acres of land. You know, so when you buy water, instead of buying this and making somebody rich, you're actually going to reforest the rainforest in Columbia and, and provide oxygen and carbon sequestering for your grandchildren. You know. So this is a result of systems approach to sustainable development. <coughs> if you plant 1,100 trees on one hectare, you have to remove 500 trees after years six to 10. This will allow for the biodiversity to come back this will provide 225 tons of wood. 225 tons of wood will make enough paper, or more paper than most of you will use in your lifetime, unless you run a big business or something along those lines, or a university. But so by buying one bottle of water a day, you, can, you provide all the paper needs you will ever need for your life. 
and whilst carrying biodiversity, drinking water, and lush growth. Here's the, here's the trees that are being taken down. So through this 1,100 trees we planted, we will plant 100 palm trees per hectare, which is two and a half acres if you're not familiar with hectares. Um, so this will generate enough biodiesel after 36 months. After three years, you'll be able to harvest the biodiesel, which we will take from the fruits of the palm tree, not destroy the rainforest like they're doing now in Colombia, Brazil, the Borneo, take down the rabbitat, the orangutan. We will leave the tree standing and just take it from the fruit. This will provide 4,500 liters, which is roughly 1,100 gallons of, ga of biodiesel. Enough biodiesel per year for you to drive 20,000 miles, which most of us don't drive 20,000 miles. So from drinking one bottle of water a day, you can provide enough energy needs to drive your car as much as you want while sequestering carbon because the trees do not get cut down. So it becomes self-sufficient in water, food, and energy. So when you, if, you, know, you buy one bottle of water a day, you, you help this region become self-sufficient. You create a sustainable community. So when you create one job created for every four hectares, every nine acres of regenerated rainforest will create one job uh, inevitably forever as long as the project is still going. You fix up to 18 tons of CO2 per hectare for a total of 162 tons per year. And that's for, uh, for 50 years. So basically that number is higher than most. And that's because in the tropics we calculate uh, the trees, the undergrowth and the soil. You know, and right now what most people do for CO2 sequestration is just count the trees. They don't kind of, they, dis they discount the undergrowth, they cut it all down. And that works in northern climates, Canada, Sweden, Finland, that's okay. But in a tropical climate, it doesn't work. And for this project, it's much different because the undergrowth is what makes the life survive and, and give the biodiversity. So what is really neat to me though, is over the past 21 years, since this project has been started and drinking water has been there, free, drinking water is free in Columbia. They believe it is a human right to have free water and clean water because if not, I was getting sick. But there's been zero kidnappings, zero combat, zero denunciations of human rights violations in and around Las Gaviotas of Marandua where we're going to do our project. Um, to me, this is one of the most important issues in the region that I know is very badly violent and very bad with kidnappings. Uh, I have been down there, I've seen a lot of scary things. Um, this is a nice mural that is uh, in Gaviotas, and this goes, is very beautiful. But here's another good case for doing projects like this anywhere in the world, not just in Colombia. We're hoping that we can do this in Africa and in Indonesia and other places. But the land was purchased for uh, roughly 80 cents per hectare. This is in euros, this presentation was in Europe. Uh, today the land is valued around uh, $3,400 per hectare. You know, so this offers a better return than it would have if they would have invested in Microsoft the day they, were, they went public. So this makes a lot of sense. But what this also does though, now this gives the local people who had nothing the ability to be bankable. They can go to the bank and get a mortgage now, build a home or start a business. You know, but before they had nothing. But now, we, now people have a, an ability to survive. So creativity and innovation, it's time to get out of the box. This is Paul Lugari, if you have no dreams, you must be sleeping. Vaclav Havel, the Czechoslovakian president, or ex-president, learning is seeing relations which we did not see before. And if it is possible, we do it today. If it is impossible, it will just take a little longer. So I say thank you for coming. And any questions, I, I'm, I'm up open for questions. So if you have any, please ask me. And if you want more information, I'm willing to give it. Thank you. And we have many different projects in a wide range of industries and, um, you know, buy a lot from mushroom farming off coffees, um, brewery wastes. Yes, John? Could you make a comment or two perhaps about uh, trigger events? Uh, it seems to me like with the pine tree that oftentimes there's a single thing that can be done that will then change all of the dynamics and therefore the outcomes will just trigger right. down to the right. Well, well, with that, what I was kind of talking about, and John asked about trigger events, uh, if you didn't hear his question. Um, when you raise the pH, you create, you change the physics uh, of the region, and that creates a new environment. And by doing that, um, it allows the, uh, an environment for nature to thrive. And so you can do many different things, and that will have cascading effects that uh, we've noticed in many different projects. 
Um, I think that, that was what you were asking, right, John? So, I mean, you just have to change a few parameters uh, that nature needs to thrive, and you can, you can do a lot with that. So, yes? No, no, what, what, what I was saying, the monoculture traced the biodiversity. Today there's over 250 species come back. The Caribbean pine will not survive over time. We, we've just now realized this recently, that the Caribbean pine will not be able to reproduce. The native species out compete it. The palm trees, uh, the bamboos, we, we don't really know what's going to happen yet. It's, it's only 30 years into the making, so we have, uh, it's just an experiment going on now, and so we, we still need to, to research it and see what happens, but we do know that the, the nature does come, nature takes over when you give, when you open the door. And it really, they weren't even really invited, they just come in. <laughs> you know. Anybody? Yes? Uh, after millions of years of geoevolution, um, the, the, uh, whenever the uh, plate tectonics collided, you could have a mountain range, and so the eastern side of Colombia is f one of the most beautiful and diverse regions of the world. And this side just had nothing. They got separated. The ecosystems got separated, and this one didn't survive. Natural, natural. It's been done by nature. Yeah. Uh, because they are destroying, oh, 1.6 million acres of the rainforest on the other side, cutting it down, so we can reforest it over here and balance what they're destroying over here. There is no. There's nothing living. Nothing there. I mean, it's, uh, that's why I was saying the sun is the best antiseptic, so not even bacteria can survive in this region. No viruses can survive. You get into the soil, it's, it's just dead, it's just dry. Because the rain won't stay, the water won't stay, it just goes right off and into the creeks uh, and the rivers, that, the systems that are there. Now, life does survive around the rivers. There are, I believe, around 17 species that usually live around where the rivers are. You know, but in a very small, you go in 10 feet, nothing survives after 10 feet. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I got involved in Ziri. Oh, she, she wanna know how I got involved in Ziri. Um, I got involved in Ziri in uh, September of 2001. Actually, around September 11th, I was in upstate New York. Uh, that's where I met Gunter. I went there to meet one of my heroes, Jane Goodall. And so I wanted to meet her, and I met Gunter afterwards and stayed with him for five days doing his first training in the United States on uh, systems design economics. And so I've been involved with them ever since. I'm now a Ziri certified practitioner. I'm taking a master's course in Turin on systems design, meeting all the scientists and the leaders and the pioneers of, of the industry and, and business and politics involved with uh, sustainability and systems design. I mean, our first week was with Fritz Job Capra. You know, we do two weeks with Janine Benyus. We have much time with many, many people. Um, but it's been a passion of mine ever since I was 15 or 16, you know, to know that uh, one day we can create a better world and humans need it now more than ever. You know, we, we can do it. We, we have the technologies, the ideas, and, and all that. We just need uh, the political spirit and the will to achieve the goals. Yeah? Oh, Out of the Box uh, by Gunter Pali, G U N T E R P A U L I. I like showing this picture here because our sewer systems all around the world are failing and collapsing. <laughs> so just something to think about. This actually, this woman had to climb out of her car and, be, and jump out to be saved. She, she would have drowned in her car. And this is in, in the Delft area, so. Any more questions? No? No? Thank you for coming.